The biggest winners and losers of NFL free agency so far is the title of today's video, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. What you should expect from this video is discussing a lot of the big signings. Uh, we're not going to discuss every single signing. You know, if a guy signs for a one-year $2.2 million deal or a two-year $3.5 million deal, we're not going to discuss every single signing in depth. Uh, but one of the biggest winners that I thought from day one was the Philadelphia Eagles. Uh, they signed Bryce Huff and they signed Saquon Barkley, and I loved both signings for the Birds. Uh, they needed some help at running back, especially after DeAndre Swift went to the Bears. They needed some some help at pass rush after Hassan Reddick requested a trade this offseason, or at least Philly was exploring trades, and Howie Roseman generally cooks this time of year, and to acquire both players for three-year deals without a lot of guarantees. I know $26 million may seem like a lot for a 27-year-old running back, but I still think the Eagles' offensive line will be good, even with the retirement of Jason Kelsey, and uh, I thought the Eagles were one of the biggest winners from day one. I know some Eagles fans at times, they get a little leery of Howie Roseman, but generally speaking, I think he has, you know, everything in the right place, and I think that a lot of what Philly does is right a lot of the time. Not 100% of the time, but a lot of the time, I like what they're doing, and I like the signings of Barkley and Bryce Huff. Two impact positions, and I specifically liked the meme of the Eagles going from Charmander to Charmillion to Charizard. Now, with Miles Sanders being Charmander, uh, DeAndre Swift being Charmillion, and then, of course, say, Saquon now being Charizard, and uh, Giants fans were certainly vocal online about Saquon going from the Giants to the division rival Eagles after saying he was going to be a Giant for life at a point, but overall I liked both signings for the Eagles, and I thought they were big winners from day one. Now, unfortunately, I think one of the biggest losers from free agency in day one was the Miami Dolphins. They lost a couple of guys, and what also needs to be remembered in losing Christian Wilkins and Andrew Van Ginkle specifically is not only are they losing two good players there, but they also have Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips coming off of major injuries towards the end of the year, and there is a very... I don't want to say good chance, but there's a decent chance that both guys aren't 100% to start week one for them in the 2024 season, and you're already in a very unforgiving conference in the AFC, so you're going to potentially have your top two edges out for maybe at least a week, maybe a couple of weeks to start the 24 season. Now you lose two more guys along the defensive line, and this overall was a very tough start for Miami in 2024 free agency, but it's also going to significantly impact them early in the year, and for their sake, I really hope they play, you know, some of the cellar dweller teams. You know, we saw them beat up on a couple teams last year, like the Panthers and like the Commanders, and hopefully for Miami's sake, they play bottom tier teams at the beginning of the year so they can kind of coast by but guys if they start out with you know a game in Buffalo or in New York to play the Jets presumably with a healthy Aaron Rodgers I don't like the start of the 2024 Dolphins season for them and I think there is a decent chance that they start out maybe two and two through four games maybe one and three and when you're in the AFC that type of start may very well be a death sentence so uh, the Dolphins I thought were one of the biggest losers from yesterday uh, in day one and uh, that's going to lead us into Christian Wilkins' contract because we are, of course, going to discuss that and what that acquisition means for the Raiders. Back to discussing some of the biggest winners from free agency yesterday, and I thought the Raiders were pretty big winners. Granted, they only had two signings, but they were Christian Wilkins and Gardner Minshew, and I know the initial thought, at least this was my thought as a Vikings fan that was potentially a team that was going to go after Christian Wilkins, is yes, you can make the case that that is an overpay at 27 and a half per year. And I think there is a legit case that that is an overpay. But here's what I would like to say for the Raiders regarding that. Are they going to not be able to pay anybody because of that contract? Do they have a quarterback waiting right now? Do they have a, you know, Trevor Lawrence is going to be the next quarterback up or Jordan Love for that matter. That would, for the Packers, it's going to be next up. Do they have a guy that they're not going to be able to afford because of that contract? No. So overall, I love that. I love that deal for the Raiders. And not only that, but now we have Christian Wilkins. We have Malcolm Kuntz. We of course have a pretty good player by the name of Max Crosby along the defensive line. And oh yeah, they also have 2023 number seven overall pick Tyree Wilson. So 
I've said this a lot during mock draft videos for the Raiders, and I think they are going to go with an offensive tackle in the first round uh, to really kind of zag while everyone else zigs. And I think the Raiders' philosophy in terms of what they're going to do this year is to continue to get after the quarterback and play smash mouth football. And I think in some ways they're going to try and do what the Lions have over the past couple of years, where they're going to win the game in the trenches. And while it may not make the most sense now, or it may not look the prettiest now, kind of like the Lions were a couple of years ago, I really like the long-term vision of what Tom Telesco and what Antonio Pierce are building. And I know they spent $110 million on Christian Wilkins, but breaking news, guys, with the increase in salary cap, of course, with TV contracts and everything, you're going to have to spend a lot of money to win in today's NFL. And this team, by the way, last year, they beat Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs on Christmas Day. Now, I don't want to get into a conversation of, are the Raiders going to take over the AFC West this year? Because ultimately, I do not think they will. Uh, but I did like the Christian Wilkins signing, and especially the Gardner Minshew signing too, after the Raiders had a lot of questions about Aiden O'Connell and would he be the guy moving forward. Gardner had a really good year filling in for Anthony Richardson in Indy, and now if we give him Devontae Adams to work with, and we still have a lot to see what the Raiders can do in free agency and the draft. I thought the Raiders were pretty big winners on day one. One team signings in particular that I was not a big fan of, this is not me calling them a loser because I did like a couple of their signings, I just didn't like one in particular, uh, but I did not like the Gabe Davis signing to Jacksonville. It's a three-year deal worth $50 million maximum, there's $24 million in guarantees, uh, but I didn't like that signing in particular because I don't think Gabe Davis is that good of a player. Um, I also think this is, you know, we're entering a year in Trevor's career where, guys, look, Trevor right now will not get a 250 or $300 million contract this offseason, the same way we saw Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert from the 2020 draft class get their contracts last offseason. And I think this is kind of a half-assed attempt to, let's push our chips to the center of the table and, oh, well, we tried. You know, look, we gave Trevor, gave Davis, and we and we tried to, tried to help him out. I, I don't like that signing. However, I did like the Mitch Moore signing a lot. I also like the Darnell Savage signing a lot for them, uh, at least for what the value is for Darnell Savage, but uh, Mitch Morse, I liked Gabe Davis. Like I said, I just, I hope Jacksonville still goes receiver in round one now that they have Mitch Morse. Uh, I had mocked Jackson Powers Johnson to the Jags for a reason, and I hope Mitch Morse can at least be that stopgap guy for at least a year, hopefully two years like the contract he signed. Um, but if the Jags do not go receiver in round one and they choose to let Gabe Davis be the number two for them behind Christian Kirk this year, then I will have a lot of uh, feedback regarding that decision for GM Trent Baalke. I know Jags fans, are they have mixed feelings towards Trent Baalke. I know a lot of people didn't like that hire to begin with, uh, but Gabe Davis was not a... I was not a fan of that signing at all. And like I said, we're at a pivotal year for Trevor. And now that we have Mitch Morse for them, I really, really hope they go with a receiver in round one to do everything they can to help out Trevor Lawrence because they are entering that pivotal year for him, entering year four. I will say one of the biggest winners from free agency yesterday was not only the Carolina Panthers, but Bryce Young. I absolutely loved Carolina going to get both Damian Lewis and Robert Hunt. And guys, we're at the point now, and I'm, I'm glad that NFL teams have, have circled back around to this, uh, but interior offensive line play is getting the love and recognition it deserves. Uh, we've seen the Chiefs win a couple of Super Bowls over the past few years due in large part to Joe Tooney, Creed Humphrey, and Trey Smith, and it's due to the belief that if you can keep the interior part of the offensive line or the interior part of the pocket clean and have a quarterback be able to step up, that is in some ways more beneficial than having the exterior, you know, with both tackles uh, being good. Not to say that tackle play is not important because it obviously is, but you get you get where I'm going with this belief. And for Carolina to spend $150 million and hopefully shore up both guard positions uh, for the next couple of years, you know, with their quarterback already being undersized as it is. I have nothing but love for both signings for Robert for Robert Hunt and Damian Lewis. Now, Carolina will need to get Bryce Young some receiver help, uh, but we've seen the impact or the money that is being spent on the interior part of the offensive line, and it's because of NFL teams know they have to be able to figure out how to stop guys like Aaron Donald, Quinnen Williams, Dexter Lawrence, Jeffrey Simmons. Those guys of the world. No disrespect if I didn't mention your favorite team's defensive tackle. Chris Jones, of course, is another one, uh, but that's, that's the point of having the 
strong interior offensive line and NFL front offices are uh, I don't want to say realizing because that's the wrong word but they are putting their money where their mouth is and they are helping their quarterbacks out by not having them take shots from directly up the middle so I absolutely loved both of those signings for Carolina uh, we know they have to uh, do everything they can to help out Bryce Young after a Trevor Lawrence like year one in a year where everything that could have went wrong for Carolina effectively went wrong and I liked what they did on day one of free agency quite a bit. I know a lot of Packers fans were upset about Aaron Jones going to the Vikings, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but I love the Josh Jacobs signing and Xavier McKinney too, which we'll of course get to, but I love the Josh Jacobs signing for Green Bay because they're getting a good player while only committing $12.5 million in guarantees to him. So if Josh Jacobs' body gives out, whether that's in year two of the contract, year three of the contract... To be honest, I doubt Jacob stays all four years, and I think this is more of a two to three year deal at most. The point is that there's only twelve and a half million in guarantees to Jacobs, so that is a huge win for the Packers in acquiring a player as good as Jacobs is and not committing an insane amount of uh, guarantees to him. Not only that, but I also think the Packers will address running back in the draft. I don't think they will necessarily take the first running back off the board like I thought they were going to really the day before free agency started, but I think this is a big win for the Packers. I know losing Aaron Jones stinks, but I think Josh Jacobs is certainly a good replacement's a strong word, but I, I like the player that Josh Jacobs is. Now for Xavier McKinney, guys, obviously we know about the Packers secondary led, of course, by all pro corner Jair Alexander, but when you bring in that much of an upgraded safety, this is going to be in some ways a no-fly zone. And what I think is also needs to be remembered is the Packers are probably going to draft a corner in one of the top two rounds. They might even take it with the 25th overall pick. So we're talking about a secondary that could have three of the four spots locked down for the next couple of years in a guy like maybe Quinion Mitchell, maybe Cooper DeGene, maybe Terry on Arnold, and of course Jair and Xavier McKinney. So I loved what Green Bay did did only two signings, but they were two big signings, and I loved what Green Bay did on day one, even after they had to replace Aaron Jones, and uh, unfortunately, they also had to release David Bakhtiari, who hasn't been able to stay healthy, but I liked what Green Bay did on day one of free agency. We, of course, can't have a free agency video without discussing the $180 million man himself in Kirk Cousins, and I like this for the Falcons. Now, Obviously, GM Terry Fontenot has had some bad quarterbacks during his tenure. Sorry, no disrespect to Matt Ryan, but a very old Matt Ryan, uh, Desmond Ritter, Marcus Mariota, uh, Taylor Heineke, and now they get their guy in Kirk Cousins. So with Kirk, now the Falcons have the eighth overall pick. They can address the pass rush in a guy like Dallas Turner, maybe a guy uh, like Layatu Latu, maybe a guy like Jared Verse at pick eight. That leaves the Falcons a lot of options at pick eight, but guys, now we get Drake London and Kyle Pitts a quarterback, and I don't think this should be a hot take, but Kirk Cousins will be, at least to me entering the preseason, the best quarterback in the NFC South, and this is already with a team that won seven games in 2023. Kirk's not going to a team that won three games and, you know, they, they scratched and clawed their way to three and 14, and they got lucky in the three wins. I know a lot of people get their jokes in about the Falcons, but... This is a great situation. Two good running backs, one great, I would say, in B. John Robinson. And like we said, both receiving options. He's going to be playing behind a good offensive line, of course, led by the former All-Pro guard in Chris Lindstrom. And guys, I like this signing for Atlanta. I like this fit for Atlanta. The only thing that I was not a big fan of was the four-year deal just because of a 36-year-old quarterback coming off of an Achilles injury, which, I mean, there's a... There's a part in that where it's kind of okay because the guarantees stop and are you know midway through year three so it could very easily be a three-year contract but look Atlanta needed to do something Terry Fontenot's job I don't want to say was on the line but his quarterback his quarterback was essentially on the line here whether he went up and got somebody like Drake May or Jaden Daniels this year or if we saw him make a splash like Kirk Cousins Terry Fontenot couldn't afford to uh, go half in half out this year and I really really respect the Falcons going all the way in to go get Kirk Cousins I love this fit and I wouldn't be surprised at all if Kirk plays all 17 games this year I wouldn't be surprised at all if he throws for 35 or more touchdowns I love this signing for Atlanta and to be honest they will be my pick to win the NFC South entering 2024 Next up is the Minnesota Vikings, and guys, I absolutely loved what they did on day one. They didn't commit over $100 million in guarantees to a 36-year-old quarterback coming off of an Achilles, which, 
again, I think they're in a little bit of a different situation than Atlanta. Uh, the Falcons don't have Jordan Love in their division. They don't have, presumably, Caleb Williams in their division. And they also don't have a team coming off an NFC Championship game appearance in their division like the Vikings do. Uh, every move the Vikings made signals that they will be going up and getting their quarterback in the 2024 draft. I love getting Jonathan Grenard. He had 12 and a half sacks last year. He's still young. They also got Andrew Van Ginkle for a very friendly deal, a two-year, $20 million contract. And with Van Ginkle, there is a connection between him and defensive coordinator Brian Flores, as Van Ginkle was actually a Flores draft pick when Flores was still the head coach of the Dolphins. So I love that signing for them. And of course, Blake Cashman. Now, I wouldn't expect anybody watching to have watched the channel several years ago when Blake Cashman was a draft prospect, but I loved Blake Cashman when he was coming out of Minnesota, so it was cool to see Cashman you know, a prospect that I liked in the draft process, go to my favorite team several years later. So I love that. And I really think the Vikings got three upgrades on defense for a unit that desperately needed it because the 2023 Vikings defense, while it was fun and while it flashed at times, a lot of the players on that unit were they weren't very good, and now we're getting Flores more weapons to work with, all with a presumable rookie quarterback under a team-friendly contract. So I absolutely loved what the Vikings did on day one, and technically they signed Aaron Jones on day two uh, to a one-year $7 million deal, and... Aaron Jones, guys, he has killed the Vikings several times over the years. I love this deal for Minnesota, and the thing is, is it's only a one-year $7 million deal, so if it doesn't work out and Aaron Jones' body is, you know, broken down like we see with a lot of running backs it's fine because it's only a one-year deal. So I like everything Minnesota did, and even with Sam Darnold, I like that acquisition too because Sam can be a good backup if we need him to be. In the absolute best case, uh, he's a Baker Mayfield or Geno Smith type player. I wouldn't necessarily expect that from Sam, but look, 17 games is a long time. We saw a ton of players go down, a ton of quarterbacks go down last year with season-ending injuries, and I would rather a team invest heavy in a backup quarterback than kind of have an effort mindset and say, we're good, knowing damn well you are not good entering the season if your starting quarterback goes down. So overall, I thought the Vikings were absolutely big winners from day one of free agency. I also like what the Patriots did by bringing back Mike and Wainu. I think he's a very, very underrated offense line. I liked what the Chargers did by bringing in the Gus Bus, and I liked what the Rams did, Jonah Jackson as well. They paired Jonah Jackson with Kevin Dotson along the offensive line. So these were some of my biggest winners. I like what the Texans did as well, bringing in Danico Autry, a veteran who has had, I want to say, over 20 sacks in the last two years, and even Aziz al Shayer. I, I liked what a lot of teams did, even Cleveland for that matter, bringing in uh, Jordan Hicks and Zadarius Smith. But guys, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please like and subscribe. It's only about 20 percent of people watching are subscribed and that's going to wrap up today's video so until next time please be safe and have a great day love you guys